In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom come, come thy, thy will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread, bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Son, Holy Spirit. Now we have the video. Uh, say something about the Mass. Why are you going to celebrate Mass? Um, because I love Mass. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We dare your glory as with one voice we acclaim. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy therefore these gifts we pray by sending down your spirit upon them like a dewfall, so they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and turned willingly into his passion, he took bread and giving thanks broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In the similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is my blood, which will be given up for you. Through him, and with him, and in him, O God Almighty Father, and the mutiny of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. Dito! Serve the Lord. Those are pictures of me when I was younger, okay? <laughs> when I had hair, okay? When I was three. No, just kidding. Uh, I want to apologize a little bit. I, I thought it was going to be a small group tonight, and I, in fact, I was driving up the highway, and uh, I realized I had my sweatshirt on, so everything's working tonight, okay? So gracias por su presencia con nosotros. What we're going to do is talk about the, uh, the Mass, and the way... I'm going to do it. Uh, forget the board. We can't. You got to use your imagination on a lot of this because I don't do this. I'm called Neanderthal. Okay. So here's the point. Let's take a few words. Like the word liturgy. What is the word litur liturgia? What does that mean? That means a public work. And the way that Greeks and Romans used, used it was one person did something for a group, 
or the group did something for one person. It was a one or all kind of word. And so the church borrowed that word because that's what we do at Mass. We, as a group, offer Jesus to the Father. Jesus, as an individual, gives us his body and blood. So there's back, a back and forth there. Then you have the word worship. The word worship means worship. Wor means worth. Ship means to acknowledge, to, to, to acknowledge the worth of God. That's why we have worship. So those are two words that we use a lot. And this is, tonight, we're going to be using some of those words again even more. If you can imagine now, this is a small version. You can hardly see this. It's, think of two small hills, okay? And we go up one, pause, come down, little pause, go up, come down. What is that about? The first part of the Mass is called the liturgy, the public work of the Word. Okay? The liturgy of the Word. And it's called Word because the first two up and down hills are all about the Word. And we're going to start with uh, an example of how this goes. I've got a couple of people who volunteered uh, under pressure uh, up here. We have Scott and Mary. They're going to stand up, come over here, just kind of stand up for a second. Now, you think Scott and Mary are very happy people? They are not, okay? <laughs> Here's the deal. Scott and Mary were married. Are you guys married? They're married. Okay, this is a good sign. Okay, they are married, and what happens is one day they have a big fight in their house. And there's steam coming out of their heads. It's really terrible. It gets noisy. It's really vicious. So what happens is Scott slams the door and takes off down the street. Now, thanks be to God, it rains. And it really rains. And so that cools Scott off. And so what Scott does is he decides, you know, that was really my fault. So he wants to go back and see Mary. But he can't just walk in. He's got to be smart. What does he do? He buys flowers. Scott is a pretty smart guy. He buys flowers. Mary loves chocolate. He buys 10 pounds of chocolate. Okay? Goes to the front door, knocks on the door. What is the first thing Scott is going to say to Mary? Perfect. Right up here, front row. How old are you? Seven, she's not even married. Sorry, okay? Sorry. That's the first, th first thing he says. What's probably the second thing he's going to say? What would you say next after you say, I'm sorry? Forgive me. Very good. Forgive me, okay? Because he wants to get back in the house and be your friend, okay? The third thing he might not say, but the third thing would be basically... The reason I'm coming back, it's not because I stepped on your foot in a bus. You're my life partner. You are great. That's what he says. You are great. You are important. And the last thing he might say is, you know, I need some help with my temper. Okay? So that's what happens in Mass. We go to Mass, and we basically say, I confess to Almighty God, going up that hill. And then we say, Lord, have mercy. Okay, please forgive. And then a lot of times, not so much during Advent, but during other parts of the year, you are great. Glory to God in the highest. And then the high point is, let us pray. Lord, we need your help. So that's the first part of the Mass. Okay? Thank you. Okay, so there's a, there's a movement. I'm sorry. Please forgive your great help. Then we come down. You guys sit down. Thank you. So Scott does all these things, and uh, we'll talk about what Mary does later. Don't let me forget. You've got to give your answer. Mary hasn't answered yet, but I'll tell you what Mary says later. Okay, that's our first. Then the second part, we go up in the Mass. Daniel and Paola, where are you? You have to stand up. I drafted them. Here's the thing now. Daniel is in the army, and he's over in Germany, 
and he writes a lot of letters to Paola. He writes so many letters. He writes on the edges. You know how some people write on the edges? He writes, use every piece of paper, every bit of paper, and he writes all these love letters every day. The guy's a romantic nut, okay? So he writes to his beloved every day, and as a result of that, uh, gives it to Mary, and Mary comes in one day, and she walks in to me, and she says, hey, Padre, I got a letter from Scott, another one. And I said, that's really great. So I read it, and I said, well, that's really good. And uh, she said, well, what are you doing with my letter? Well, I said, you've read it five times. Oh, she says, I filed them. Being a priest, you wouldn't know that, see? I file these letters. I save these letters. They're important to me. I get to know his good days and his bad days all about him because we're communicating. Now, there's another guy out there named Andrew. Anybody named Andrew? Say no. Good. So Andrew's out there, and he sees how this thing's operating, and he says, I'm going to kind of copycat Daniel. So he writes one letter to his girlfriend. It's at Christmas time, and he's seen Daniel, and Daniel's asked, you know, uh, he's asked Paola, you know, could you help me with this and do a few things? And Paula, no problem, because we're friends. We love each other. Not so with Andrew. He writes one letter. What do you think that his girlfriend would do if she got that one letter at Christmas asking for a lot of help? Tear it up! One letter. The only time he wrote was when he wanted something. He never wrote before, after, or during, okay? So what it talks about is there's something going on. We call those letters love letters from heaven. That's the scriptures. That's the Bible. Those are God's love letters telling us who we are, who God is, how we relate, what are the good things he sees in us, what are the bad things he sees in us. And so that's why we keep reading scripture. We have Old Testament readings. We have the gospel. We read all that. We have homily talking about the love letters from heaven, and in between we have psalms to kind of reflect on what's been read. We have the Alleluia, what's going to be read, that type of thing. So this is a movement. First of all, we clear, clean up our act, you know, the way Scott and Mary did. They got their act together. That's why the first part of the Mass is very important because it's not going to be coming in late all the time because you're not really ready. You want to be ready so that when you get to the next part, you're ready to really hear the word and understand what it is. How are we doing so far? Hay preguntas? Oh, this, I've been speaking in English. Dispésame porque yo no estoy preparado para ofrecer este mensaje en español, pero solamente primero siento mucho, después perdón, después gloria a Dios, después Ayúdame, ok, es el, el plan. Y después, cartas del cielo, como ellos, ok, cartas, la escritura es la carta de Dios, muchas cartas de Dios, la razón porque leemos estas cosas cada domingo es para saber mejor el amor de Dios para nosotros, ok, that's a summary. That's pretty good, ok, so far, we're doing, ok, all right. So that's, that's the very first part of the Mass, and, uh, why it's important, it, it gets us ready. The liturgy, that's all the liturgy of the word. We go to God, God comes to us. And then we pause. Do we believe all this? And that's when we say the creed. There's, we go up, come down, and then we kind of pause and we say, do I believe? I believe in God, I believe in Christ, I believe in church, I believe in etc., etc. Okay, so then we kind of look back and say, we believe in all this. You guys can sit down, you've been good. Write some more letters, okay? All right. I say you're a good guy. You better write letters. Okay. So that's what happens in that first part of the Mass. We get ourselves ready. We listen to the Word. That's why, again, coming in late for Mass, is not so much as a bad thing in itself. It's good, but it, we got to prepare for it. That's why I would say, you know, in most parishes now, you have the readings for the coming Sunday. And I would take that in your bulletin, parish bulletin, in English or Spanish, and kind of read the readings for the following Sunday. So when you come to church, you're more prepared, you understand a little bit better the love letters, and maybe you'll get a further explanation during the course of the Mass. All right, I'm going to pause. Any questions up to this point? Can you hear me? Everybody can hear me? Good.
or too bad? One of the two. Okay. So, then we go to the next part, and the next part of the Mass, again, up and down, we, per, we go, basically, the gift, in this third section, we're giving to God, the gift equals the giver. We offer the Lord bread and wine. Now, that's no big deal in itself, unless it stands for the giver. So when we offer God bread and wine, and we offer him our collection to help with what's going on around the world, around the parish, all that has to stand for something. Like sometimes, I don't know if you did it, I know that I may have done it younger, you'd go to church and you stand in the back, and all the boys look at all the girls. You probably have never done that, but sometimes it happens. The boys observan a las mujeres, tal vez es mi amiga, o va a ser mi amiga en el futuro. Well, that's not the purpose of Mass. It's not to get a girlfriend or a boyfriend. The purpose of Mass is to come together as a community and basically offer a gift. You know, this is liturgy. The group offers a gift to God. And so during that third part, we offer bread and wine. Why do we offer bread and wine? We could offer chocolate and cookies, but we offer bread and wine. Why? Jesus did. That's why we do it. We just follow what Jesus did. So it's a symbol of life, and we're so grateful for it. We always speak about putting bread on the table. It's a symbol of food nourishment. God nourishes us. So we offer that gift back to God. And hopefully, it's not a cheapo gift, but a good gift. And then we come to that high point, the consecration. And at that point of the Mass, Jesus takes our gifts and he adds his own. It'd be like a little kid and a mother having a birthday. You know, the little kid gives his mother what he did, wrote in school or painted in school, and his dad comes in, because his dad's a good guy, It has maybe a little ring or a little special gift, and he says, let's put them together. And they put them together, and th this is our gift. And we do that exact same thing in Mass. We offer bread and wine, and we give our best, but the point is, God says, I wanna, Jesus says, I want to make it a little better. And so, he adds himself, himself, his body and blood, and we offer that gift to the Father. And so that's the high point because Jesus has done that for us. But it's really important for us to say, I've got to be tied in with that because that gift has to set, uh, symbolize me. So if I'm offering the bread and wine, am I offering myself? But if I go to church and I'm kind of looking around, or I'm sleeping, or I'm not really attentive, the Mass is happening, but it's not happening within me. So that's our chance. That doesn't mean sometimes your mind's going to wander. No problem. But just keep trying to bring it back. And that's why we have hymns, why we have standing and kneeling and sitting, because we want to use our whole body in the process of worshiping God. Okay, then we come down. We have the high point where we consecrate. And then we come to really what seems very insignificant, but it's very important, through him and with him and in him, con él y en él, okay, that part of the Mass, it's at that part where we say one little word, and that little word is perhaps our biggest word in the Mass. I mean, the biggest word of the people. Amen. amen. What people, when they say amen, are meaning all that you've done in our name, Father, and all we're doing with you is getting our stamp of approval. Amen. So be it. May it happen. It's a hard word to translate. But that's what that amen means. And that's why, strictly speaking, the priest shouldn't say anything at that point. It's not his word to say. We make a mistake, we do. But basically, it's not the priest's answer. It's your word. You're saying amen to what's going on. Okay, then we come to the last part. We just said that we, the gift equals the giver, okay? And now the gift is given back. Let's go back to Scott and Mary, our dynamic duo over, over here, okay? They've cooled off. The rain has gotten them to feel better. He's in a good mood. Here's the thing. When he gives 
marry the flowers. If she accepts them, what's she going to do with them? This is a tough question. What's Mary going to do with them? Yes. Put them in a vase. All the answers are up here. He's gonna, she's going to put them in a vase and put them someplace and say, they're really great. I, it's wonderful. Thanks for thinking of them. And they're expensive roses. You know, roses are expensive now. So he spent a lot of money on these roses. But he had to, okay? Because he wants to get back in the house. What's she going to do with the chocolate? Wait, try somebody else. Let's try another hand. Yes. What else is she going to do with it besides eating it? She loves chocolate. But what else is she going to do? What's, what, is she going to give it anybody anything? She's going to share it. Because when you share the gift, what you're saying is, you're back in my good graces, okay? We're friends again. And so, you gave me 10 pounds of chocolate, you know, I'm going to give you some of it back. A little bit, anyway. You get my point, though. What's happening is, there's a sharing going on. Mary has accepted Scott back in the family, and what God does is, is he says, I'm not just going to take your gift to me, I'm going to share that with you. It's the best you could do, but it's also the best my son can do. My son has no one better than he is. This is the best gift possible. You are going to receive this gift today at Mass. Wow! That's the point. And as a result of that, it's special food that nourishes us, but it changes us. So everybody who comes to communion at Mass ends up a little bit looking like your neighbor. Maybe a little more hair, but okay. Do you see what I'm saying? That, that we become more lookalikes. That's the plan of God, okay? That when we break bread with our brother and sister at the altar, the result is that we ourselves become more like each other. We form a community. So when we leave this church, we really are brother and sister, more brother and sister than before, if we've been taking this whole thing seriously. And that's the point. The Mass is the best thing God can give us in terms of gift, because the Mass is all about His Son, Jesus. And Jesus is all about His Father. And so that's why in a sense, when the church makes a big deal out of the Mass, it's because it is a big deal. There's no bigger deal. And our danger is sometimes that we go kind of automatically and, you know, we sit in the same seat, talk to the same people, go to the same Mass, and it can get boring, okay? So the idea is to say, what can I do on my part to make sure the Mass does not become that for me? My preparation. The first part, checking out how my attitude is. The second part, doing some reading, not just in church, but at home. That's why we stress we should get to know the Scripture more. To be ignorant of Jesus Christ is to really, I mean, to be ignorant of Scripture is really to be ignorant of Jesus Christ. And so the more I read about Christ, and the more I let him into my life, what happens is I become more like him. And so... I start thinking more like him. And this is a year of mercy. Remember the Pope started that on October, I mean, on uh, December the 8th, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. And he said, this is the year of mercy. So this is our chance to put into practice what the Lord is saying. And God knows, and you know, and I know, as we read the paper, see television, we need some mercy. We've got a lot of hardcore thinking out there, and we've got to, say we've got to be countercultural, like the Pope says. We have to be merciful people. The whole thing is, you've seen that bumper sticker. Charity is contagious. Let's start an epidemic. Okay? How do you say epidemic in Spanish? Epidemia? Epidemia? Epidemia. Okay? Caritas. La caridad es... Contagiosa. Portagiosa. Tenemos, tenemos que comenzar un, una, una epidemia. Yeah, okay. 
Okay, that's what we want to do. All right, let's hold it there. Any questions? Entonces, quiero disculparme porque no estoy preparado para español. Otro día voy con español, okay? She, I pre, hay preguntas? Are there pre, questions? Okay. Oh, some I, I can't see. Oh, yeah, yes. Ari. My name is Ari. Hi, Ari, how are you doing? Uh, my question is, what do the colors mean behind you? Oh, the color, thank you. The colors, different things. For example, green usually refers to hope. Most of the Sundays of the year, they call them ordinary Sundays. They're in green. Then you have white. White is a sign of new life. White is a sign, for example, baptism or wedding, new life. Uh, purple uh, is more a sign of penance, advent, color, get more serious about your life, or Lent. So we have more somber types of colors. Uh, gold is kind of a substitute for white. Again, that's kind of a special day. It's maybe Christmas, Easter, Pentecost. Pentecost is red, usually red, sign of the Spirit. That refers, red is a sign of martyrs and of the Holy Spirit, the tongues of fire. Those are those colors. Is that good? All right. Why are the pink candles? Why, why the pink candle? Yeah. Well, good. Well, we, we, we asked that first. Uh, you have, you have three pur we have three purple or violet. I'm not good on colors, but anyhow, they're dark. Uh, the, uh, uh, we use rose or pink because the Sunday is called Gaudete, the third Sunday, the halfway mark of Advent is called Gaudete Sunday. It's like the church says, you've been doing what you're doing, for three weeks, you need a little break. So let's rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Paul says that. And it's really true because you're working at trying to be a better person, but you can't just be working, working with, you know, kind of knuckle, knuckle fists. There's got to be a, a kind of a, a back off. And so that's what the, the pink or rose color stresses. It's more a lighthearted approach. So that's, and then other border points, a lot of times they're, more for decoration, you know, art, artistic purposes. Father, yes. I'm sorry, sorry. we have a shy one over here. Yes. So I'm going to ask for her. Okay. Why do we sit down, stand up, kneel, sit down, stand up, kneel, sit down, stand up, kneel? I think the church wants us to lose weight. No, no. no. Well, different positions have mean different things like standing like a lot of churches in Europe they don't kneel, they don't kneel they, they stand because their thought is you know the mass is at attention you know they think of being around the table with the Lord as something that really is something to stand up for over the centuries we developed the kneeling position as we started thinking well we're not that good we do a lot of sinning so it's kind of a penitential form, and especially when it comes to Advent and Lent. So we kneel at those times. Um, other times we sit, there's no real good reason for sitting. We could stand as well as sit. But I think over time, as churches put more chairs in, in the beginning they never had chairs at all, uh, they started putting more chairs in, uh, they, people needed it, like old guys like me, you know, you gotta sit down once in a while. So I think that, that's more the, a practical purpose there. Now the thing, part of the problem is different churches have different understandings. And this is, causes confusion, right? Hello, is that right? Yeah, we're not all together. Each diocese usually has kind of a general way of doing things. And it kind of depends where you live, to tell you the truth. You know, a lot of places they, they just stand or they kneel a little bit, you know, they never, they never sit, because there's no chairs. Some of these big cathedrals in, in uh, Europe, all they do is stand. Or you wanna, if you want to kneel, you've got to bring your own kneeler. But 
Over here, a lot of different dioceses, I think especially because as we stressed a lot the idea of sinning, you know, we're all expert sinners. Most of us have a degree in sinning, okay? We go to school for sinning, right? Our own house, our own life, which is not good. And the result of that is we realize we're pecadores. And so we kneel down to kind of bring that fact out. But it depends on ultimately the pastor and what the parish, like this parish, for example, for years uh, stood. Father Fran Celia, he's now the vicar general for the Diocese of San Jose. His uh, uh, thinking was for years, and back in the 80s, etc., you know, we should be doing more standing. So they didn't kneel here uh, very much for years, and now we're back to year, uh, kneeling more. And again, the same thing with bells, you know. Some people love bells. Other people say, why do we have bells? The purpose of bells in the old days was because the priest was facing the other way, and the people couldn't, didn't know when things were happening because it was all in Latin. And so and a lot of times, you know, in some of these old churches, they, they had a wall, especially in Lent, they'd put a wall up, you know, like Mission Dolores, San Francisco, they had that wall they put out, and uh, the people didn't know what was going on, so then they rang the bell to let them know, well, now you can see everything, so there's really not a reason for the bells, and so different people have decided, no, we don't need the bells. Others say, yes, we love the bells. Depends. So it's okay if you want to quietly ask me, I guess I'm just yes. asking for everybody. So why is it that we drink the wine out of the same glass, and what is the wine? Is it, is it, what kind of wine is it? There are all different kinds of wines that are approved uh, by different bishops and different dioceses. And uh, sometimes it's white, sometimes it's red. I'm not a real expert on wine, but uh, there's... We drink out of the same glass. The, the idea is because it, it's supposed to. We receive it from the blood of Christ. Oh, people get worried about, about disease and stuff, but you know that has not really been a factor. I don't know if people are aware of that, but... The cases that are reported of people, you know, having trouble because of the same cup are really minimal. In fact, a lot of times what we do in this diocese is when we have a cold season, that's when we stop the chalice from being passed around to kind of help out. I don't know. Who is that saint on the wall with the red cape? I don't even see it. I can't see him either. Pardon? Oh, Santo Nino. The Santa Anita is the uh, infant of Prague, Prague, Czechoslovakia. It started in the devotion in Prague, Czechoslovakia, and the missionaries took it out to the missions, and it really stuck in the Philippines. And so they changed the name from the infant of Prague to Santo Nino. You know, same person, same size, same color, you know, all that stuff. But I mean, it's basically the same devotion. But that's why, like right now, if you were Filipino, you'd be getting up at 5.30 in the morning, or going to 5.30 Mass in the morning for nine days. Nine days. That's called devotion. Okay, it's a devotion the Filipinos have, Santo Nino, the Christ child, asking him to bless them and their families. Beautiful devotion. Yes. I'd like you to walk out of here with a sense that the Mass is the greatest gift God has given us in the person of Jesus Christ. You know, and to remember just a little bit about the diagram. We go to God, God comes to us. We go to God, God comes to us. You know, very simple diagram. It, that's, it's like an M upside down. It's like an M anyhow. So it's easy to remember, you know. The readings on the Sundays. I know that for readings on the Holy Days, there's special ones, but how is it chosen per Sunday? What readings for what Sunday? Oh, there's a, a liturgy committee uh, worldwide that has drawn up uh, the readings. There's a three year cycle, A, B, and C, for Sunday readings, and there's a two year cycle for weekday readings. And they 
try to get as much of the Bible in over that course of those three years or two years as they can and try to put things together. Usually on Sunday, the first reading and the third reading go together. The second reading is what they call uh, ongoing scripture. They'll take a book and just keep going through it. But the, usually the first and the third hook up together, have something in common, except during Advent and Lent, they try to get them all going together, have something in common. But it's a, a, a liturgical committee worldwide that does that. And there's a worldwide book, different languages, but the same book. So, um, what are the numbers on that board for? The no right here, here, the music universe. What are the numbers? The numbers. For the music, for, for songs. Is that what you mean? Yeah, you just explained it to... Oh, okay, oh yeah. Pardon me. Oh, it's okay, yeah. Do you want to explain it? The numbers? Oh, it's, 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 it, 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 in your breaking break, some of them are... Oh, I'm baptized. sorry. Oh. So there's a book in your um, pews called The Breaking Bread, and it has all of the songs that we sing in Mass. The number, yes, will be posted on there. So when my kids go to Mass, they actually count the number of songs. They say, oh, we have five songs. And when they sing one song, four songs to go, three songs to go. They follow the numbers on there according to the book so they can sing along and then know when Mass is almost done. In Espanol, esta parte está en amarillo. El color amarillo en Espanol. En el misalito. Can you, tell them, can you tell them who's actually supposed to do the singing in Mass? The people. Yeah, the pe it's supposed to be the people doing the singing. I mean, the choir is there. Sometimes you have a choir that dominates, and that's got to be checked. So you basically say, don't sing everything. But the people are, are but that's your participation, your voice. As St. Augustine says, a person that sings prays twice. That was his theology. And some people say, I can't sing outside the shower. Okay, well, too bad. Sing outside the shower, anyhow. We want to hear you. Yes? Forgive? Oh, it is, because the healthier this couple is with each other, the healthier the whole church is. We are the body of Christ. Here are two members, and if they're reconciling, they're coming closer together, they're living better lives as individuals and as a couple and as a family, the church has more juice in it, more life in it. That's why when we have confessions on a Saturday, the person doesn't just get forgiven for themselves, but they're being in a better place thanks to their absolution, the church is healthier. That's why when nobody goes to confession, the church is not as healthy as when we have regular penitential services and we kind of realize we are sinners, but God forgives. All right, and the question over here. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about Holy Day of Obligations and why do we have to go to Mass on some of the years and not all the time? Good point. The Holy Days are kind of, uh, what depends on different countries have different Holy Days. Uh, those are days that are considered like more important. Like if you go to Italy, it would be St. Peter and Paul would be a big day. If you go to Ireland, it would be St. Patrick. If you go to some other countries, they have saints that... Uh, maybe not, are not as important, but the ones, the big ones in each country are ones that they say people should go these days because we want them to make a statement that this particular feast is important to us. By and large, they're pretty much the same. There's different individual saints that are stressed more and more, but by and large, they're mainly mysteries of Christ or of Mary and one of the saints. Like in this country, we have six, you know, three of Christ, two of Mary, and one of the saints. And I think that uh, the reason is to, 
you asked this. Oh, the second question is, why some years and not others? Well, for some days, if they fall on a Saturday or a Monday, a lot of times with some of these holy days, the church says, well, they've, all, they've already gone to Mass on Sunday. Let's say this year, since it doesn't fall on a Saturday or a Monday, we'll say, for example, New Year's. A lot of times New Year's is not a holy day of obligation because it doesn't fall on a Saturday or a Monday. And it's not as important as some of the other days, like Ascension or Assumption. Okay. Two questions. How old is this church? Okay. This, I think, was uh, built in, uh, this church is 1927. 27, 26? 29. He burned down 28. 28. He, bur he knows. He burned it down, so he knows. Lay people, EMs, collectors, altar servers. Who are the, those people? What do they do? How do they? How do they get? The job? Well, basically, very good question. If you want to be a minister, a minister would be a, a lector, an usher, a choir member. You know, somebody that gets involved, liturgy committee. If you'd like to become part of that, you talk to the pastor and say, "I'd like to volunteer my services. What do you think?" You know, and then he'll talk to you about that, because we always need more ministers, especially at some masses, if you want, as far as Eucharist, but there's also a real need for lectors and trying to get younger people, too, not just older people or more mature people, younger people that have hair, okay. <laughs> but what do you say to some of the people who don't, um, who are a little, think that they can't do it because they don't well, we have classes. We have classes uh, for different ministries. And that's important because you go to a class, and the main thing of the class is not so much just to find out what to do. The other thing is to basically uh, learn more about your faith. Because the more a person knows about their faith, the more they want to serve. I want to know how to um, answer the question. If, if you have a friend who is not uh, Catholic or Christian, Salvation. Absolutely. I grew up with the old catechism. I think Jesus wrote it, you know. We're going way back, and this is a, there's a lot of misconceptions. Even in the old catechism, anybody, anybody, okay, who lives as good a life as he or she can with whatever knowledge they have, can, does, go to heaven. When we grew up, there was a tradition talking about unbaptized babies. Where do they go? They used to say they would go to a place called Limbo. Since the Vatican II, they just dismissed that. It was a theological theory because they couldn't figure out how people who weren't baptized and died as babies ever got it. And they said, well, they can't go to heaven because they don't know anything about God at all, or, you know, they haven't lived, and they can't go to hell, they didn't sin, where do we put them? We've got to put them somewhere. But now they've dismissed that very much. Yes? We could uh, clear off the table. I've got some of the tools of the train okay. over here. Sure. Explain to us, okay. Um, well, good. Thank what you. they are. Okay. We're going to show you, what that little boy was showing you, and that uh, picture, the little pre-priest guy, you know? I'm going to talk to him. He's going to be a priest when he grows up, whether he knows it or not. Yeah. Father, while you're preparing, can we have one last question? Sure, sure. Oh, okay. Yes. Hi, Father. Uh, I'm Gail. Uh, I have a question about baptism. Yes. Some religions look at baptism questioning um, where they don't baptize till they're, say, eight years old, opposed to the Catholics who may have baptized at babies. Um, is there a reason why there's that difference between...
Yeah, it's pretty much a different concept. In the beginning, what the church did was baptize everybody. I mean, in a sense, they'd baptize families is what they did. And so in the beginning, most of the people, you know, coming in would be adults who brought their families. As time went along, more and more, the people were simply babies that needed to be baptized. And so we started baptizing babies. The idea is pretty much the example I use is this. Let's say you're Italian. And in an Italian family, you grew up eating pasta. Okay. And let's say when you get to be a teenager, you start to like meatballs. No, you like Irish food. You like potatoes and meat, okay? Now the point is, you grew up Italian, but if your parents didn't feed you Italian food when you were growing up, you wouldn't grow up. And so they made the choice when you were little. As you got older, you made the choice for the kind of food you want. And the same thing is true here from a Catholic point of view. We baptize into the church so a child is brought into the community. However, that child, as that child gets older, that child has to make his or her own choice. It's not automatic that they do. What a lot of other Christians do is they feel, hey, we should do, let's do the baptizing later and let them make their choice first. So there's a different stress. We kind of feel, well, once they're in, they got a better chance of being nourished as they're going along. They would feel we, can, we nourish them in another way. So that's pretty much the reason why the difference. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, so this is called uh, this a, du a double duty. We have uh, where is the patent? There's a plate. Here's a plate. This is called the patent. Okay, and on this is placed the host. The bread is called a host, and it could be small or it could be larger, but it's a host, and it's placed on this. And then you have the chalice, the cup, that's this. Usually they're very nicely designed uh, artifacts. Usually they have, a lot of them have uh, some kind of gold lining inside, you know, or that type of uh, precious metal. Not all, but a lot of them have. Then you have what's called a ciborium. A ciborium is where the Blessed Sacrament is reserved. In the early church, what they would do is they would... Uh, like you'd come to Mass and your mother was sick, they'd give you the host, you'd go home and give it to your mother, okay? So if they had hosts left over, they started figuring out, we gotta reserve these hosts, and so they, they put it aside in the sacristy. Then as the time went on, that became the tabernacle, it became a bigger and bigger deal. So then we started putting it outside the sacristy in a side altar, and then they started putting it on the main altar, and then it became what it became in the Middle Ages, you know, the place. And yet, the tabernacle is not as important as the altar. It sounds funny. But the tabernacle is a reserve, reserve for the Eucharist, but the altar is where we offer the sacrifice. So the altar table, in that sense, is more important even than where the host is reserved. Uh, one quick thing I will say is, for us Catholics, we are, when it comes to the Eucharist, uh, people who really are fundamentalists. We don't think of ourselves as fun. We believe that what Jesus said is true because Jesus in John chapter 6 is all up the hill and he's telling them about his body and blood and the people start walking away. Jesus does not say to them, I made a mistake. Jesus says to his apostles, will you also go? In other words, he believed what he said. And so when we receive Jesus, our belief is, this is really and truly, in a mysterious form, the body, the real body, the real blood, the real Jesus, same Jesus that's in heaven, comes to us. That's how big this gift is for us. That's our faith. Yeah, that's good. I think that's pretty much This is just a cloth they put out there, purificator, kind of nice on the altar to clean it up. And then this is, uh, the priest washes his hands. Why do we do the hand washing? We do the hand washing because in the early church, they, the gifts they would bring wouldn't be money, they'd bring food. And so the priest's hands got all dirty, and so they cleaned them up before they went on to the rest of the Mass. So uh, symbolically, we wash hands to kind of remind ourselves to clean up our act before we keep going. What is this thing for? 
That's called a pall. They also use that for a funeral, you know, big ones for a funeral. But it's kind of to keep uh, flies and stuff off the, out of the chalice. Uh, you guys have been very patient. Gracias por su atención. Okay, hay mucho trabajo en su parte. Trabaja todo el día y está con nosotros esta noche. Yo no quiero prolongar su agonía. Okay, but, but gracias por su atención. Thank you for, your, for being here. Okay, great. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners.